people are living uh, in what is called a, a digital world. There's physical and digital. And so it's like putting them together that we are, uh, oh, it looks like we're online now, that we are um, together the body of Christ here, there, if anybody's watching over there. And so we want to be ultra-intentional to connect in whatever way we can. Uh, now, sometimes that, that, uh, that digital world is messy, okay? Um, but that's okay. Sometimes uh, community is messy and fellowship can be messy. So let's lean into the ways that we interact this morning with each other online, with each other and, and throughout the week. Let's, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Today, God, I, I thank you for the sure hope of the resurrection from the dead. We thank you, God, for, for Dolly Quarter and her life. God, we thank you for the life of, of Verl's uncle, Lord God. We thank you um, that as their life here on earth ends and there's that grieving and there's that mourning, it's hard that there is great rejoicing because there is no pain, there's no sorrow, there's no sickness, there's no cancer in heaven. It's your presence. And, and God, we thank you for that. We worship you. Lord God, we lift up those in our congregation uh, that either have been diagnosed with COVID or kind of in limbo land waiting on a test result. God, we pray healing and health for them. Uh, God, we... Um, God, we lift up uh, Josh Freeman as he continues uh, to have healing in his hand. God, we pray that you will keep infection out of his hand, that you will give him full and, and complete uh, healing and recovery. God, we lift up our hearts to you this morning. We want to worship you today. We love you, God. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You are here. Moving in all your needs, I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, and that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, and that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, and that is who you are. 
That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, and that is who you are. Unreserved, unrestrained, your love is wild, your love is wild for me, it isn't shy, it's unashamed, your love is proud to be seen with me, to be seen with me. Cause you don't give your heart in pieces You don't hide yourself to Jesus Uncontrolled uncontained your love is a fire burning bright for me it's not just a spark it's not just a flame your love is a light that all the world will see all the world will see Cause you don't give your heart in pieces You don't hide yourself to Jesus You don't give your heart in pieces. You don't hide yourself to Jesus. Your love's not fractured, it's not a troubled mind. It isn't anxious, it's not the restless kind. Your love's not passive, it's never disengaged. It's always present, it hangs on every word we say. Love keeps its promises, it keeps its word. Honors what's sacred, its vows are good. Your love's not broken, it's not insecure. Your love's not selfish, your love is pure. You don't give your heart in pieces. You don't hide yourself to teach us. You don't give your heart in pieces. You don't hide yourself to Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, thanks for uh, bringing us all here this morning, God. I pray that um, going into Thanksgiving this coming week, God, that you just help us keep in mind all of the things that 
we can be thankful for God. I just want to say that I'm thankful for, for you this morning, God, and thank you for letting us come and be in your presence, God, and in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm Sean Betzelberger, and I am one of the elders here. Thanksgiving is more than an annual holiday. For Christ's followers, it's a vital spiritual discipline. Jesus often modeled giving thanks for us. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, Jesus thanked his father for hearing him, John 11. Before he fed the 4,000, he gave thanks for what was available to him, seven loaves and a few fish. Jesus lived a life of thanksgiving for the big as well as the small. And the early church followers' example, the apostle wrote, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Don't miss the words with thanksgiving. Giving thanks is an attitude that is part of our lives, especially in the circumstances of this past year. We need to live with this attitude instead of worrying we can be thankful because we trust in an all-powerful powerful God in every situation, in every circumstance of life. The word for thanksgiving in Philippians is also used in 1 Corinthians. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The word for thanksgiving in Philippians is, um, sorry, the word used in both cases is a form of Greek, of the Greek word Eucharist. It sounds familiar. Eucharist literally means giving thanks or gratitude. Eucharist became the word, the word believers sometime before AD 100 used for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. This is an incredible significant, incredibly significant. As followers of Christ, we gather together every week to give thanks for Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, which brought us, bought for us eternal life with him. Thanksgiving, Eucharistos, is also an act of worship. Worship is more than something we do in a building once a week. It's a part of who we are and whose we are as Christ followers. As we take this bread and this cup, reminders of Jesus' crucifixion, crucified body, and shed blood, we do so with eternal thanksgiving and with abiding worship. Let's go to our Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us examples in, in your word, Lord, for thanksgiving, and thank you for allowing us to participate um, in this communion with you. Thank you for dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins so that we can live with you eternally. It's in your son's holy and precious name. Amen.
Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. It looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Ooh, oh. Lay your burdens down, oh, you're in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, it ain't welcome anymore, oh, you're in the Father's house. Arrival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. Failure's never final when the father's in the room. And failure's never final when the father's in the room. Lay your burdens down, oh, you're in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, it ain't welcome anymore. Oh, you're in the Father's house. prodigals come home the helpless find hope love is on the move when the father's in the room the prison doors swing wide the dead come to life love is on the move when the father's in the room Let's sing that again the prodigals come home the helpless find hope Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Miracles take place, the cynical find faith. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Oh, here in the Father's house. Oh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door. It ain't welcome anymore. Oh, you're in the Father's house. Oh, you're in the Father's house. Lay your burdens down. Oh, you're in the Father's house. You're in the Father's house. You're in the Father's house. And there's a grace when the heart is on the fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, 
I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding how I've been set free Where another died for me There is another in the fire All my dead left for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I won't bow to the things of this world I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire Standing next to me is another in the waters holding back the seas should I ever need reminding the power set me free there is a grave that holds nobody now the power lives in me there is another in the fire oh there is another in the fire another in the fire oh, it's another in the fire oh, and I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where sin I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in nothing stands between us nothing stands between us there is no other name but the name that is Jesus he who was and still is and will be through it all So come what may in the space between All the things unseen and his reckoning I know I will never be alone I know I will never be alone Be another in the fire Standing next to me be another in the waters holding back the seas should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me I'll count the joy from every battle because I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy from every battle because I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy from every battle I know that's where you'll be I count the joy from every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be God, I thank you for your presence in the midst God, as we prepare to dig into your word God, we thank you that you are the one that stands in the fire with us God, your word says that when the, when the fire blazes, that we won't be burned. When the waters come, it won't come over our head because you are with us and you love us, Lord God. So God, as we dig into your word today, I pray that you will encourage us, that you will strengthen our faith, Lord God. God, I pray you'll give me your words to speak, God, that they'll go out with your power to give us encouragement, to challenge us, God. We want to be faithful in the midst. We want to be patient in affliction, Lord God. We love and worship you in your name, we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. 
Well, good morning again, everybody, whether you're here in, in this building or you're watching online. So we are continuing our sermon series on Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Now, like I said last week, this challenge from Scripture, I think, is so important for us as Christians living in the world at, at this time. You see, God desires for us to be joyful in the midst. He desires for us to persevere through hard times and to remain faithful through it all, faithful until the end, so that we may bring him glory and that we may shine the light, his light, into a dark world that so desperately needs him. Like the world needs Jesus, and perhaps uh, that, that's never been more true in our life than right now, maybe. I don't know. We, we live in a pretty dark world, right? The world has always needed Jesus, but, but today they need him the most because guess what? Today is the day. Right now, it's today. And tomorrow, they'll need him. And when tomorrow is today, then you get what I'm talking about, right? Today is the moment that we have. So now with that being said, finding success in this and being joyful, patient, and faithful, like this is a spirit-enabled thing. Okay, this isn't something that we just pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and go for it. I'm going to be joyful. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. No, this is something that comes as we continually abide in Christ. Remember that, that come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and you will find rest. Come to me, learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So it, that's where the strength comes from to do this, from this abiding in Christ. Now again, is this going to be a, a perfect abiding? No. But you see, the Christian life is this. The Christian life is a life of continual repentance. It's a continuing to say no to self, no to the things of the world, and yes to God. Throughout our whole life, there will always be this draw away from God. And the, the life of a Christian is a life of continual repentance, continually turning away from that and turning back to God. When you stumble and fall, getting back up. It, it's a life of, of endurance. So today, we're going to focus on how to make it through hard times. But before we start to unpack the part of that verse that be patient in affliction, I want to again read the chunk of scripture from Romans chapter 12 uh, that this be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer comes from. And, and I want to do this. We're going to do this each week in this sermon series. And here's the reason why. Romans chapter 12 is like the Christian life stuffed in one chapter. Okay, And we are specifically focusing on joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. But what I want to do as we go through this, as we read through this part, is my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will highlight something from here that this may be how, the ne this may be the next step that he has as you're walking in endurance. I think God wants me to focus on this part of my life. This is how I actively wait for the day. So, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 9, okay? Uh, but before we get there, remember Romans ch chapter 12 is we just had 11 chapters of the grace of God. And so Paul says, in view of that mercy, give God your everything. Live for him. Don't be conformed to be like the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind as you get in God's word. Learn to see yourself through God's eyes and walk in the gift that he's given you. Okay, that's verses 1 through 8. Then he says this, Love must be sin sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, not as far as it depends on the other person, but as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, become over, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So as we go through this sermon series the next couple of weeks, we'll read this through and just ask God, will you take one of those verses, one of those phrases, and highlight that? What are you calling me to do in this next season? Where do you want me to focus on? Is there a relationship 
that there's not peace, and you want me to take the next step to make peace? Uh, do you want me to do what I can to pursue uh, loving strangers, loving those on the outside? Maybe, maybe you really want me to, to look at who in this congregation has needs that I can meet. What is God highlighting in your life as we look at, at this key verse for our sermon series, Romans 12, 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Uh, now, last week, we talked about being joyful in hope, and then the main part of it was for us to keep our hope in front of us, that Jesus is our hope, to keep our inheritance in front of us, that, that we have in Christ this inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. It's kept in heaven for us, okay? And to let that bring joy in our lives. Today, we're talking about affliction, okay? Now, uh, that word for affliction, okay, uh, it is different than the word that's, that's used sometimes as trial or testing. Like, what it literally means is oppressing, okay? It's a word that would be used for, for tribulation. It's the same word that Jesus said, in this world, you will have trials, you will have hardship, you will have tribulation, that, that there is this pressing that's going on. And that word there for patient is a word that we've, we've unpacked uh, uh, several different times over the last a couple of years. It's hupomeno. And, and it literally means to remain under or to endure. Uh, so this, this verse isn't just saying for us to be patient in affliction. What he's saying is remain steadfast until the end. Withstand the pressing of the world, the tribulation of the world. You, you know what? It's interesting. We go through hard times. Jesus said we would go through hard times. I think that you could look as life on this earth as one tribulation, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that there's nothing good or there's not joy, but you know what? This is not heaven. We face a consistent pressing. We are not crushed, right? Okay, like when my brother was here and he had that, that can of pop and he was squeezing and squeezing. It's not crushed because it has that pressure inside. We're not crushed because the Spirit of God is inside of us, but we feel that pressing. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, I want you to endure to the end. I want you to be able to remain under this load. Now, this idea of being patient, it's not just a passive waiting where we're like, well, we're waiting until this affliction is done, so we're just going to wait and wait and wait. It has this idea of an active waiting. Okay, it's not necessarily the waiting that would be if you're waiting in the doctor's office or something like that, and you're, you got there early, so you're sitting there in the waiting room or maybe in your car these days because that's where you're supposed to wait sometimes. Uh, it is the waiting and the endurance that comes at mile 25 on a marathon where you have been in the midst of this trial, this tribulation of running 26.2 miles. I don't know who in their right mind would want to do that, right? Not me, but somebody out there, maybe. And you're at mile 25, and you want to endure to the end because you want to make it through to that 26.2, that that's that hoople mental that God wants uh, to build in us. So how do we endure through tribulation? How do we do it? Let's, let's look here. These are, these are four things, okay? This is kind of going to be the so what at the end as well. I'm going to frame it around this. We look up. We look up at our Father in heaven who is faithful, who is loving, who is kind. Uh, the scripture says that he has this multi okay, which means compassion. It's the same compassion that the, that the good Samaritan saw when he saw the man who was beaten and, and left for dead, that God looks at us and he sees us in our plight and he has this many-fold compassion and pity and mercy and grace. And so we look up to him in the midst. We look back and we see the faithfulness of God in the lives of his people in scripture and the lives of his people over the last 2,000 years. And in your life, where have you seen God's faithfulness show up? And we look back to the cross of Jesus Christ, that ultimate expression of God's love and faithfulness. Then we look around. You know, we're all in this life together. And we look around and we say, who in this body of Christ can I lean on because I need their comfort? And who looks like they need the comfort from me that God has given me? We're in this together. And finally, we look forward to the day when Christ returns and we learn how to endure, to actively wait. So let's start out by, by looking up. We want to remember that, that God is faithful. We're going to uh, be popping through uh, several different scriptures today. So feel free to, to flip around to that. They're also on the Bible app. They'll be up on, on the screen as well. So we look to God because God is faithful. Number one, God is faithful to his name. In the book of Exodus, Moses encountered God, and, and God came through, and he proclaimed his name here up on the screen. God passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, the compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet, 
He does not hold the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the fourth, third and fourth generation. So God's character is that he is loving and gracious and kind and the one who forgives all types of sin. And, okay, sin is punished. And we look at the cross of Jesus Christ and we see how those come together. Sin was completely punished in Jesus. And now the grace of God is held out to everybody who would believe in him. God is faithful to his name. He is gracious and kind and forgiving and just. And the justice of God has been met in Jesus Christ. And so if you have not accepted Jesus as your Savior, then, then I encourage you today to look at him and receive his grace as shown through Jesus. So God is faithful to his name. Okay, He's also faithful to complete his work in us. Okay, first, uh, Philippians chapter 1 says this. Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Then get this, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Okay, that's like that song we sing. There's another in the fire. God walks with us and says, as you walk with me, I will bring you through this. I will help you endure until the end. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, Paul says this, May God himself, the God of peace, may he sanctify you through and through. May your whole body, your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will will do it. The God that we serve is faithful to his name. He's faithful to complete his work in us. And number three, he's also faithful to provide. In the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, Paul, Paul says this, in the midst of thanking and being full of gratitude for the Philippians, that they would give unto him and give to the ministry, he says, in the midst of your sacrificial giving, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Okay, he's echoing what Jesus himself said. Jesus said that when you give, it will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over into your lap with the same measure. You give, it will be given to you. God says, as you put me first, I will provide for your needs. I will provide for you. God said that he, was, he is faithful to his name. He's faithful to complete his work in us. And he's faithful to provide. The last one I have up here is that God is faithful to be with us in this life. He is faithful to work things out for our good. And he's faithful to bring us home. In Hebrews chapter 13, the writer says this, Keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have. Why? Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never, ever will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? God said that he will never leave you nor forsake you. He's always going to be that one in the fire. He's always going to be the one in the water. When you are in a tribulation or a trial, God says he is right there next to you. And his endurance is what is going to carry you through. Romans chapter 8, we get some more encouragement about this. Uh, that Paul says this, we know in all things, all things, the good, the bad, the ugly, the things that Satan wants to use for evil, God works them out. God is big enough to work through the worst things that Satan wants to use for evil to bring them for good to who? To those who love him have been called according to his purpose. And later on he says, who shall separate us from this great love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all of these things we are more than conquerors or we overwhelmingly conquer. We trample over our enemies through what? Through him who loved us. Verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything. Get that? Anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we echo with the Apostle Peter what we talked about last week. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power into the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to go through trials of all kinds and suffer grief. These have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by the fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise 
glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? Because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. How do we make it through hard times? We look up first. Let's look here on the next slide. We look up first. God is faithful. He's faithful to his name. He's faithful to complete his work in us. He's faithful to provide. He's faithful to be with us in this life, to work things out for our good and to bring us home. So when we go through trials and tribulations, through these hard times in life, and and we will, right? Jesus promised this, right? In, In John chapter 16, he said, in this world, you will have tribulations. You will have trials. Same word in Romans. And he said, but take heart for I have overcome the world. This is in a chapter where he's told them about the Holy Spirit. I'm getting ready to leave, but I won't leave you as orphans. And you know what? A time is coming where you're going to be persecuted and hard things are going to come to you. But I have told you all of this not to freak you out, but you may have peace in the midst. Why? Because you will have trouble. You will have tribulations. There will be hard things. There there will be things like the pandemic we're in. There will be tough times. There will be times in the country where you're in where, there were, uh, where politics, are, everybody's at each other's throats and there's confusion about what's going on. And he said, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Jesus died and rose again. And because he rose again, Christians, we will rise again as well so that we can echo 2 Corinthians. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary Troubles, that's that same word, tribulations. They are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but we look up. But on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So when we go through hard times, and we will, how do we get through it? We talked already about looking up. Let's look a little bit at at James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. When we go through hard times, this is what James says. And again, he, he's writing to Christians in the first century who are facing persecution. They're being ostracized for their faith. And he says, when you go through trials, when you go through times of testing, I want you to consider it pure joy. When you go, James, I don't understand. Why? Why am I supposed to consider it pure joy when I go through times of trials and testing? He says, because of this, verse 3, you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, develops hupomeno, that ability to endure. And when perseverance, when endurance finishes its work, you will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So we see we can have joy in the midst of trials because trials and tribulations can be one of the tools that God will use to finish his work in us. Now, I don't believe that we can look at every trial that comes and say, this, God brought this on me. I think God works in ways we don't always understand. I think that often the case is that we live in a broken world and people make decisions and choices that that negatively influence us and bring trials and tribulations into our life. That, That Because sin is in the world, the world is cursed. And so there's sickness and there's diseases. And God says, yes, this trial may have come into your life, but I can redeem it and work it for good to grow you, to help you have this perseverance so you can make it to the end. And when you get to the end, you will be mature and complete. You won't be lacking anything. And skipping down to verse 12, there's a blessing. Blessed is the man. Blessed is a woman who perseveres under trial. For when he has stood the test, when he has gone through that and has been shown to be approved, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So how do we endure through trials? We look up, we look back, we look around, and we look forward and actively wait. We've kind of unpacked a little bit about looking up, that we look up at God, we recognize that trials are something that God can use for our good, that he promises to walk with us through the trial to bring us to the end so that we are mature and complete and there's a crown for us at the end. So let's take a moment to look back. We're going to go to to Hebrews chapter 11 to look at this. And really, you could flip to almost any story in the scriptures to look back at God's faithfulness. You could look back at the Israelites crossing through the Red Sea. Uh, You could look back at Elijah and the fire coming down from heaven. Well, this is kind of the writer of Hebrews uh, looking back. And and he starts with with Abel, the, the first person that was 
was killed on this earth, okay? And he says, look, by faith, Abel gave, gave the sacrifice. By faith, Noah built the ark like God wanted, and, and, and God saved him. By faith, Abraham left his land and went to a place that God was calling him. And then in verse 13, he says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have, would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And then he moves on to talk about, by faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob walked in the way that God had for them, that the promise continued through them, that by faith, Moses rescued the people of God and led them through on dry land, and by faith, the people of God conquered Jericho, walked into the promised land, and then he says in verse 32, what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who get this, and I'm going to slow down a little bit, I often get really fast when I read this, but through faith, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they may gain a better, better resurrection. They gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers in flogging, while others were chained and put in prison. They were executed by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. By faith, those in the past went through hard times, and they overcame, and there was a victory. Other people went through hard times, and they overcame, and it didn't look like victory in that moment, but it was victory. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with endurance, with perseverance, hupomeno, the race that God has marked out for us. Consider, or let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, consider Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's leave that up there just a little bit. So we look up at who God is and how he can use trials in our life, and we look back and we see his faithfulness. And I think the thing that we look back the most to is here fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ, looking back at the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, in the book of Isaiah, it says that, that Jesus, that, that the suffering servant was a man of many sorrows, well acquainted with grief. On the cross, Jesus was in the middle of his own, his own tribulation, his own trial. God understands the pit you feel like you're in. Because he's been in a place like that as well. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, if there's any way I don't have to go through this, but not my will, your will be done. Uh, there's a song that I love, I love to listen to called Just Be Held by Casting Crowns. Uh, and, and it's so good when you feel like you've got everything on your shoulders and, every, and it's just like let go and let God hold you. And this is part of the verse. It says, if your eyes are on the storm, you'll wonder if I love you still. But if your eyes are on the cross, you'll know I always have. And I always will. We look back at the faithfulness of God. Look back in the stories of your own life, your parents, your grandparents. But we look back at the cross and we see a God that enters into suffering, enters into tribulation, and overcomes. And it can be so easy for us to look out and see the waves and start sinking like Peter. But when we look to Christ, we look to the cross, we know that he is always there with us. And in fact, he's been there the whole time. He's always loved us. So we look back. We look up, we look back, we look around. James goes on at the end of his book in chapter 5, verse 13, he says this, if, Is any one of you in trouble? You should pray. 
If anyone's happy, let him sing songs of praise. If anyone's sick, he should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise him up. If he sinned, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And there's a lot of truth in there. And, and connecting some of the, the, the things behind here with what we're talking about is if things are, if things are hard, go to God in prayer. If, if things are good, go to God in worship and praise. If you are sick, and that word can mean physical sickness, but it means without strength. If you are sick, if you are empty, if, if you are mentally things are, are, are tanking or spiritually, you are in a place where you are without strength, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, go get help. Reach out. Go to God together. And yes, here it's talking about, I believe, physical sickness and bringing the elders of the church, but I think this verse is talking about we need to look around. Community is so important. And why is it so important? Let's look at this next verse in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles and our tribulations. Why? so that we can comfort those in trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. Here, as a Christian, part of your calling is to take the comfort that God has given you in the midst of your trials and to see who needs that comfort. So this looking around is both ways. It's I need help. And going to somebody, will you pray with me? Will you encourage me? Will you bear my burden? I need help. And it's also saying, who needs help? God, show me. Highlight somebody here in my midst. Highlight my neighbors. Who needs special encouragement from, from you? Maybe we've gone through something similar. That, that as we go through this trials, we look up, we look back, and we look around. Who, who can help me and who can I help? That's how we make it through trials. We look up, we look back, we look around. And we look forward. James says this in James 5, 7. He says, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Uh, this is a different word than hupomeno, okay? Uh, it's a word that, that we often see uh, maybe in the King James as long-suffering because it means distant passion. Let your anger and your frustration that would come up be something distant. Be patient and wait. We look forward because in the midst of this trial that we're in, this is a season. However long it lasts, it's only a season. However long, whatever trial you are in, it's only a season. The kingdom of God is what is eternal. So be patient and wait. And again, that waiting isn't just wait. Just kick up your feet and wait. That's not what the farmer does. He's waiting for the rains. He's out preparing his field. He's out planting his crops. He's making sure that the weeds are out of the way. Uh, he, he's doing everything he can so that when the rain comes, his field is ready. And that when it's time for harvest, he's done everything that it is. And yet that's out of his hands. He can't control the rain. He can't control those things. He has to wait patiently for something that is out of his control. But he knows it's going to come. And then it says, stand firm. Literally, strengthen your heart. This is something we see in the, in the book of Psalms. Psalm, uh, David sometimes like, says, oh my soul, I'm telling you to do this. My soul, put your trust in God. You know what? Sometimes we need to tell our hearts the truth, even when we don't feel it. Oh, my heart. Oh, my soul. Put your trust in God. His kingdom is eternal. It may feel like what I'm in right now is bigger than anything and is going to last forever, but that's, it's just a season. He is coming. The judge is standing at the door. The one who has judged sin and now can bring forgiveness and grace is coming, so be patient in that and actively wait. Be ready. And what does that active waiting look like? Well, something that uh, my family has just gone through is welcoming a newborn into this world. And there's an active waiting, okay? You're, you're, you're waiting for this day. You've got multiple months for it. And you don't just kick up your feet and don't do anything about it, okay? 
uh, especially for us. Our house is, is still being worked on, but it was like there were so many things that we needed to do. The active waiting was like making freezer meals and putting them in the freezer. The active waiting uh, was putting drywall up in the house. The active waiting was tearing out this carpet and putting floor down before the baby came because if we didn't do that before, it wasn't going to happen for a long time, okay? And so there are these things that we do when we know something is coming that we actively wait for that. So what is that in our life? What is it that is going to last for eternity? Investing in your relationship with Christ. Investing in your relationship with your family and others. Learning about your spiritual gifts so that you can walk in them and be a disciple who makes disciples. You see, earlier this year, like way early this year, before the pandemic came, uh, we preached through things that are um, the spiritual disciplines, right? And it's been a while since we talked about them. But those things, the, the, the breath prayers and the silence and solitude and scripture reading and study and prayer, all of those things, those can be like signposts in our life of a different way of living. They can become anchors for us. So if you feel like your life has been anchorless in this time, it may be a good time to revisit some of those spiritual disciplines. of, In the midst of this shakiness, I want to I take this in order to invest in something that's going to last forever. And then finally, he, he ends this with, don't grumble against each other. In the midst of your tribulation, don't take it out on each other. Christ is coming. The judge is coming. Evil will be judged. Righteousness will be given. Forgiveness and grace. So endure. Press on. Be patient in affliction and make it through. And we may say, how? It is so hard sometimes. And the challenge for us is this. We look up. We look back. We look around, and we look forward to the day when Christ returns, and we actively wait. And if we look here on the last side, how do we actively wait? It's about bringing the kingdom of God nearer, doing the things that invest our relationship with God, doing things, uh, uh, investing in our relationship with others. And then you know what? Sometimes when you're trying to make it through something, it is simply doing the next best thing. So as we went through this sermon today, what is God highlighting? What is the next best thing for you to do as you walk through this life? What does that active waiting look like today or this week? So I, I challenge you as we as we continue to, as we close out the service, Corbin, if you want to come on up, read through that chapter twelve of Romans. What is God highlighting to me? I want to make it through the hard times. What is that next best thing that God wants me to do? And you know what? Maybe the next best thing for you is that you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior. And so the next best thing is for you to realize and, and say, I, I need a Savior. And Jesus has, has come and died in your place to take away your sin. And maybe that's the next best step. If that's you, please reach out to me today, whether you're here or if you're online, please let us know. Because you see, in the midst of this life that we go through, there will be seasons of tribulation. We're going to close in, in a song. And if, if you want to stand and sing it, if you know it, go ahead. But, but you can also just sit and just soak in it. This song is called God of All My Days. And, and, and what this song is about is we go through different seasons and different times, but the God that we serve is the God of all our days. He's the constant one. He's the one we can build our lives on him. So let's come to him and rest that we may truly be patient in affliction and make it through hard times. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your character and your faithfulness. I thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ. God, part of how we make it through this and we endure is to look to you and be grateful. Thank you for being the God of all our days. We love and worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. to you my heart in pieces found the guide feeling innocence I turned to you everything behind me found the God makes all things new look to you drowning in my questions Found the guide who holds all wisdom. 
and I trusted you and stepped out on the ocean. You caught my hand among the waves because you're the guide of all my days. Each step I take, you make a way. And I will give you all my praise. My seasons change, you stay the same. You're the God of all my days. I ran from you, wandered in the shadows, and found a God. Who relentlessly pursues I hid from you Haunted by my failures And found the God Whose grace still covers me I fell on you When I was at my weakest I found the God the Lifter of my head and I've worshipped you and felt you right beside me. You're the reason that I sing. You're the God of all my days. Each step I take, you make a way. And I will give you all my praise. My seasons change. You stay the same. So the God of all my days. In my worry, God, you are my stillness. In my searching, God, you are my answer. In my blindness, God, you are my vision. In my bondage, God, you are my freedom. In my weakness, God, you are my power. You're the reason that I sing. You're the God of all my days. Each step I take. And I will give you all my praise. My seasons change, you stay the same. Cause you're the God of all my days. In my blindness. God, you are my vision. And in my bondage, God, you are my freedom. All my days. God, I thank you for your presence in the midst. God, this week as we prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving in whatever way we're able to with our family, we pause in gratitude for you. That you have made us that you have saved us, that you are with us, and that you promise that your endurance, God, will carry us through as we walk with you. So, God, we worship you and we love you. You're the God of all our days. We thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, if you want to say hi to those that are, that are watching online, the iPad is over there on that high top table. And uh, we'll see you next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great Thanksgiving. Bye-bye.